Welcome to the forum, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The forum is a collaboration between the Harvard Chan School and independent news media. Each program features a panel of experts addressing some of today's most pressing public health issues. The forum is one way the school advances the frontiers of public health and makes scientific insights accessible to policymakers and the public. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, my name is Yasmina Boutalib and I'm a healthcare reporter with Reuters and today's moderator. With the much anticipated midterm elections coming up next week, we thought we would discuss the 2018 midterm elections, key issues for healthcare. Our panelists today, starting from my immediate right, are Robert Blendon, Professor of Health Policy and Political Analysis at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Harvard Kennedy School. John McDonough, Professor of the Practice of Public Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Gail Walensky, Economist and former Director of Medicare and Medicaid Programs under President George H.W. Bush and a current Senior Fellow at Project HOPE. And joining us remotely is Ovik Roy, Co-Founder and President of the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity. This event is being presented jointly with Reuters. We're streaming live on Reuters TV and the websites of the Forum and Reuters Health, and we're also streaming live on Facebook. This program is going to include a brief Q&A, and you can email questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. You can also participate in a live chat that's happening on the Forum site right now. So to set the stage, let's take a look at a video from Reuters about the positioning around the Affordable Care Act that both parties are taking going into the midterms. Josh Hawley, he's for the insurance companies, not you. With the November elections fast approaching, political attacks are once again flying over former President Barack Obama's Affordable Care Act. But this time it's the Republicans who are taking the heat, not the Democrats. I'm Andy Sullivan in Washington, where nearly a decade of political wisdom is being flipped on its head. Obamacare was seen as a loser for Democrats. Now they're rallying around the law and using it to bludgeon their Republican opponents. They're calculating that voters are more interested in expanding access to health care than scaling it back. Republicans, meanwhile, are downplaying the issue. In Missouri, Democratic groups are attacking Republican Senate candidate Josh Hawley for trying to dismantle the health law in court. Ads like this one play up the personal benefits of Obamacare without mentioning it by name. 2.5 million Missourians have pre-existing conditions. Their Attorney General Josh Hawley went to court to rip away health care. In West Virginia, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin has been using the same approach in his ads to go after his Republican opponent Patrick Morrissey. Now the threat is Patrick Morrissey's lawsuit to take away health care from people with pre-existing conditions. He is just dead wrong, and that ain't going to happen. Nationwide, Democrats are bringing up health care more than twice as often as Republicans in TV ads, according to the Wesleyan Media Project. That's a big change from past elections, when Republicans were more likely to talk about it. Republicans used repeal and replace as their rallying cry for years. Now they've largely gone silent after failing in several attempts to overturn Obamacare under President Trump. And despite the health law's well-publicized problems, some 24 million Americans are now benefiting, many of them in poor states that Trump carried in 2016. That hasn't stopped him from trying to weaken it. Obamacare has been broken and it's been a broken promise. This comes as potential presidential candidates like Elizabeth Warren are rallying behind a sweeping proposal that would extend government health care to all Americans. That would make Obamacare look like small potatoes by comparison. It's not likely to happen anytime soon, but it's another sign that the politics around this issue are shifting. And this time, Democrats are confident they're on the winning side. Bob, you've done your own polls and you've analyzed the findings of polls from elsewhere. 
And we're actually lucky because you're the author of a paper that was just published yesterday as a special report in the New England Journal of Medicine called Healthcare in the 2018 Election. So based off what you've seen, what do you think is going to drive Americans to the voting booth on Tuesday? So let me give you a quick overview. Uh, also, uh, you should discover uh, the candidates follow the polls. Uh, every speech is in a poll finding that you just heard, all the, all, all the ads. So let me just give a quick uh, perspective here. Uh, uh, first, uh, when you're discussing this, uh, uh, based on the last four elections, unfortunately, half of adults in the United States will not vote. So the data I present are based on people who are registered to vote or actually say I'm registered and likely to vote. And it's a different crowd than just looking at a regular, uh, regular poll. Uh, so uh, uh, first point is, if you did this for years, uh, you would be quoting Tip O'Neill, uh, who would tell you that all house races are local. Wrong. Uh, this uh, election is all nationalized. Uh, 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 the candidates are all running on national, they're not running on how to fix uh, sewers in Missouri. Uh, uh, for that, it's, uh, uh, for that. Uh, secondly, which isn't covered well in a, in a healthcare forum is, there are two sets of issues going on. Uh, so this year, two thirds of likely voters say a principal reason they're voting is a referendum on President Trump. Forget these other issues over here, a referendum. It is the highest of the last four elections. Uh, for that, at the moment, more are gonna vote against him based on this than vote for him in, in this referendum. So on one side, you have people coming out, I'm just gonna vote as a referendum of what happened the last two years. The other there is a set of, of uh, uh, issues. So if we could just show the first slide for a second, and these will be very, uh, uh, quickly. Uh, so uh, uh, what was asked here is giving people 15 issues that are in the news. Often people just get four. And what's the most important issue? And they got every issue in the news that's been discussed in the last few months. And these are just the top uh, five. So uh, there's literally a statistical tie among all voters. Uh, between health care, gun policy, Supreme Court, which again, three months ago, you would not have had any discussion about at all, economy and, and, and education. But quickly, if you look at Republicans and Democrats, they're in a different world. Uh, so Republicans do not mention health care, period, as something they're voting on. Uh, Democrats, it's statistically overwhelming. It is a top issue for Dem uh, Democratic uh, voters. Uh, so the next issue is, what does that actually mean? Uh, all of us can go home at night and say, oh, I'm for health care. What does it exactly mean? So we gave them 11 choices. And you got on the list if you were in the newspaper. It wasn't intellectually very exciting. Just you're in the newspaper. So next slide. Uh, so now you're going to see where the ads came from. Uh, so these are, of the 11, these are the top six. Uh, the uh, most predominant are the top four, which is don't take things away from people. Uh, and so there are four of them, of which the top uh, is something called pre-existing conditions. 10 years ago, if you go back, we could not find that anywhere except on the business page. This was a technical term in the insurance industry. Today, it is the most mentioned term by voters. It has become a moral and emotional issue. So the ads you just saw picked up on that and everyone is saying, uh, don't take it away from me. Uh, so the top four issues are don't take that away, don't take Medicare coverage away, uh, don't take the, uh, those who got insurance away, uh, don't cut Medicaid. The other side is do something about healthcare costs and something about drug costs. And we'll talk about this later, but drug costs started out as the top issue that everybody was talking about. But it is not at the moment. These other things have gotten to be uh, 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 there. So I want to just make a quick point about uh, the election and what it's going to mean, and then my colleagues uh, uh, will discuss uh, more fully. And people may not fully uh, watch this. If I was giving this talk, uh, in the mid-1990s, I would tell you that the issues that are top to all voters would determine what the new house would actually do. There was a high association between, if you said this was the big issue, what the house did. Uh, uh, years later, there is no association. What there is an association is, if the house is democratic, what democratic voters want to do. 
there's no association with all voters. So looking at 52% of voters wanted something or other has no relevance uh, for what happens. What happens is the majority party follows the people who most actively voted for. So just two s uh, slides and then uh, uh, we'll, we'll quit. You could see what people talk about polarized elections. This is pretty, so this is 10 years after the ACA was enacted. You're asking uh, voters uh, who are Democratic, uh, you want it to remain in place. Uh, I know you don't need a statistical help to figure this out. 87% of Democrats say yes. Uh, basically, 85% of Republicans still, 10 years later, want it repealed, placed, altered. They don't want to keep going on. So uh, uh, tell me who the House is, and I'll tell you the direction they're going to go. The second we just played through in the Supreme Court nomination, next uh, and last slide. Uh, so uh, the issue of abortion remains one of the most divisive. Same thing. What's going to happen in the next House or possibly the Senate? If Democrats are in control, efforts to make sure it remains legal in most cases, period. Not a discussion. But look at the Republican bar. It's not the same bar uh, uh, for that. So Republicans, including the Supreme Court choices, are moving away from uh, having abortion widely available. So my colleagues again the specifics, but you have to understand in the polarized world, the election matters because the core of the two parties are, are so far apart. Uh, so is there anything that people agree on just so you can go home? Yes. Opioid abuse, uh, the NIH uh, and uh, research, uh, fighting pandemics, and there is a general agreement, do something about drug prices, but no agreement about the it uh, uh, for that. But let me just close with the point again, when we're all talking about how important healthcare will be, remember most voters secretly said, I'm gone because I have a view about the president and I'm going to express my overall view. So when it's over, it's not just a single issue. It's going to be a, a very important referendum on what we thought of the president. So John, you've advised the U.S. Senate on health care reform. So can you share with us some of your predictions for what you think will happen if Democrats take one or both chambers of Congress? Mm -hmm. So thank you and nice to be here. Nice to see you, Ovik. <laughs> Hi, Jonah. Um, so thinking about the most likely outcome based upon an amazing number of polls is that Democrats retake majority in the House of Representatives and Republicans retain a majority in the United States Senate. And so what differences will that make in terms of what may or may not happen? Uh, the first thing is if Democrats are in the House majority, then any effort for repeal and replace, repealing the ACA, replacing it with someone else, is more than likely way off the table and isn't even pursued because it doesn't have anywhere to go. There might be votes in the Senate on it uh, in one way or another, but it won't, it won't happen. It's, it's gone at least until the next election cycle, and we'll see where we are after that. Um, most people think, I believe, that any possibility of any gains at all in terms of restoring, rebuilding, or stabilizing the ACA beyond where it is now are off the table. I'd say I don't think that's true. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, who is the likely Speaker of the House, is one of the most skilled uh, political operators we've seen in modern times in terms of leading that institution and is very skillful in terms of establishing strong negotiating positions with the Senate and then with the administration. And anything that the administration or the Senate wants, there will be something needed in return. And those asks will include some meaningful progress, not something revolutionary, but things like, for example, reinvesting in outreach and enrollment support for the health insurance exchange and reestablishing navigation that kind of level, not earth shattering, and yet some important progress in terms of stabilization uh, could happen. Uh, I don't think you'll see any significant efforts to undermine or, uh, or damage Medicare or Medicaid uh, in such a Congress. Um, and perhaps there may be, depending upon what happens with the Trump administration, some efforts to block regulations that the administration may try to advance. So it'll be a different environment. Uh, it won't be earth shattering, monumental change like we've seen in past Congresses. And I don't think it will be a do nothing Congress where uh, nothing will happen. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that the 2020 presidential election begins next Wednesday. 
And so we will see significant conversation around what should the next agenda be for the next administration if it's a democratic administration. That will heavily focus on Medicare for all and other kinds of reform plans. I think there are about 10 reform plans that have already been introduced by Democratic members across the Democratic Party in Congress. And that will be a very provocative and lively conversation that will have very little impact inside Congress in terms of what happens. If Democrats beat the odds and take the House and take the Senate, then the ability then to use the budget process to get some gains in terms of reestablishing and solidifying and building up the ACA, I think are enhanced. I think the other political reality is from the perspective of the White House, if Democrats do very well next week, then it's certain that one of the reasons they did it, and perhaps the most important reason, is health care. And so President Trump, looking toward re-election, will want to do some things to try to mitigate the image and the damage to the party's reputation that's been done over the past couple of years. And that then, particularly if you have a Democratic House and Senate, opens up then perhaps even more um, substantial uh, gains in terms of trying to uh, build up on the ACA's agenda. Gail, what do you see happening particularly to entitlement programs such as Medicare and Medicaid? Um, the answer uh, at the bottom line level is not very much. Um, with regard to Medicaid, its expansion was very popular with the governors. Uh, one of the reasons that repeal and replace in its full format had no chance was that there were a lot of Republican governors who had expanded Medicaid and they were not interested in giving back either the expansion or the money that went with it. Um, this remains a very popular vehicle. Uh, it has been actually the workhorse of expanding insurance coverage. We focus a lot about the exchanges. Most people who are newly insured are newly insured because of the Medicaid expansion. The governors get that, that and the additional enhanced match rate that was part of the Affordable Care Act. Medicare should be a problem. Of course, this is somebody who's been saying we need to look at Medicare since I was running it in the early 1990s. <laughs> Obviously, my uh, warnings haven't been heeded. The challenge, of course, uh, is that we are immediately focused on 2020. And notwithstanding the fiscal realities that we have made promises to existing seniors and people who will be seniors over the next decade that we don't know how to fund yet, there is not going to be any action going into the 2020 election. Uh, I agreed with 95% at least of what John said, uh, and definitely I agreed most heartily with the fact that the 2020 election starts next Wednesday. So entitlement reform, that is making Medicare fiscally solvent in any kind of responsible way, that is not going to be one of the discussions. For me as having run Medicare, and shared the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, whenever I hear the phrase Medicare for all, I immediately want to say, stop, let's make Medicare viable for those we've already promised Medicare to before we start having that second discussion. But of course, nobody really wants to have that discussion. That's not as interesting. Not as interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ove, could you give us your analysis of what the Republicans are thinking heading into the elections next week? Well, uh, I don't think in terms of health care, they're thinking about a lot of terms of the congressional elections. I mean, I think the one thing that's important to understand about, uh, and Robert alluded this, uh, to this a little bit in his remarks, if you look at it historically, uh, the salience of health care in whether it's presidential or midterm elections, and Bill McInturf, the pollster for NBC News, has done a lot of good work on this. What we see in the 2018 uh, political polling data is that healthcare has returned to a kind of normal state in the sense that you'll, it, when you pull people and say what issues do they care about, if you pull Democrats, they'll say healthcare is very important to them. You pull Republicans, they'll say healthcare is not that important to them as an issue. Uh, and for swing voters, it's, it's sort of in the middle. 
Uh, and, and so uh, while there's been a lot of political advertising about uh, pre-existing editions, much of which obfuscates the actual policy problem of pre-existing editions, uh, I, I don't think we're actually seeing an election that's hinging a lot on health care. I think, as, uh, as others have alluded to, it's really the 2020 election where health care is going to be a significant issue. Uh, as has been noted, as soon as those returns come in, uh, our entire focus is going to be about the 2020 election, particularly on the presidential level. And what's interesting here, as I think everybody knows who's either watching or participating in this broadcast, uh, the, the Democratic presidential primary has focused extensively on single payer and various ideas of how to get to single payer. And I think what's interesting, something that isn't well known uh, because it hasn't been big news, I guess, is that the Democratic National Committee uh, earlier this year, if I recall correctly, changed its rules so that unlike past presidential uh, primary contests, the so-called superdelegates will not have a vote on the first ballot in the Democratic nominating contest, which means the Democratic base, the people who vote in primaries and caucuses, are going to have outsized influence. They're going to determine the results of that primary contest. What does that mean? That means the progressive base is really going to demand of the flag bearer of the Democratic Party in 2020 a forthright advocacy of single payer. And what does that mean? That means that if, if the Democratic candidate is held to having to endorse full-throated single-payer, not just a public option, the exchanges, or Medicare buy-in, or some of these other incremental ideas you hear bandied about in, in think tank salons, but, but full-throated single-payer, where you end the role of private insurance in America, there's going to be a lot of room for the Trump administration, for Republican candidates in Congress to, to run a more pragmatic campaign on health care, and I think that's going to be an interesting thing to keep an eye on. So... Medicaid expansion, which is a key element of the Affordable Care Act, is an important election issue, especially in states where the expansion is on the ballot. So let's take a look at another clip from Reuters. This one is about what's happening in Idaho, a Republican state. We're just volunteers talking about the health care vote coming up. It's an all-out effort to beef up Obamacare through the ballot box, and it's happening in Idaho, one of the most conservative states in the country. Yeah. So you've already voted and you voted yes on two. Absolutely. I'm Andy Sullivan in Gooding, Idaho, where volunteers are going door to door trying to build support for a measure that would expand health coverage for low-income people. It's a key part of President Obama's Affordable Care Act, and many Republican-dominated states like Idaho have opted not to participate. These volunteers volunteers are bringing the issue directly to the voters. It's not a conventional campaign, as you can see from this camper. <laughs> For more than a year, Luke Mayville has been driving a green van through the back roads of this western state, talking up Idaho Proposition 2. We thought Medicaid expansion was something that was big and monumental and that would improve people's lives on a grand scale and would bring people together. The ballot measure allows people in Idaho to decide for themselves if they want to expand the Medicaid health program for the poor. It's on the ballot November 6th. Montana, Nebraska, and Utah have similar measures on the ballot. If voters approve them, some 400,000 low-income residents across the West could get health insurance. I get so angry when I think about this because there are so many people, like my sister, that cannot afford her medical bills, that, they, that her insurance won't cover. Leading the opposition is the Idaho Freedom Foundation, warning that state residents could wind up paying more than they expect. The conservative group's Fred Birnbaum points to neighboring Oregon, which had to raise taxes earlier this year to pay for its Medicaid expansion. Based on the experience from other states, we think it'll, it'll bust our budget. Fis fiscally, it'll be unsustainable. If voters decide to expand Medicaid here in Idaho and other western states, it'll raise serious questions about whether Republicans will ever be able to scale back popular but expensive safety net programs, which is something they've tried to do for years. After all, repealing Obamacare has been one of the party's top priorities going back to 2010. Now voters may be poised to strengthen it. So let's dig deeper into this issue of Medicaid expansion, and then we'll take on some of the areas we touched upon earlier in more detail. So just a little setting of the ground. So the ACA, as was written and signed by President Obama in 2010, mandated that all 50 states had to open up their programs to all low income on January 1st, 2014. 
you know, between 2010 and 2014, the Supreme Court in 2012, in their big case, Sibelius versus NFIB, uh, ruled that the Medicaid expansion had to be an option for states rather than a mandate. And so since then, there has been this state-by-state -state battle on expanding. And the last state to expand was Louisiana in 2016. And that brought it to 31 states that have actually implemented the expansion. And since then, honestly, it's been a, it's been a long, cold, lonely winter <laughs> in terms of Medicaid expansion. And we might be starting to see a sunrise um, at some point in the near future. And the question is, is it kind of like a midwinter sunrise where the sun barely shines, or is it a summer sunrise? And we'll know next Tuesday a lot. And we'll know because, first of all, uh, Virginia is going to expand their Medicaid program on January 1st to 400,000 low-income residents in that state. They would be, they'll be state number 32. Uh, Maine, particularly if the Democrat, the Attorney General Janet Mills wins, uh, they, their voters already voted in 2017 to expand and Governor Paul LePage blocked it, literally, in spite of the uh, vote of the, of the people. Uh, if Janet Mills comes in, they will expand quickly. They'll be state number 33. And then depending upon what happens in these three referenda states, Montana's just voting on funding to continue their expansion. Utah, Idaho, and Nebraska would be a new expansion. So they'd be states number 34, 35, 36. Uh, and interestingly, it's not, it wasn't mentioned, just two days ago in Idaho, the current incumbent Republican governor, uh, Bruce Otter, uh, uh, came out, and he's been blocking Medicaid expansion as long as he's been governor, came out two days ago and endorsed the Medicaid expansion and actually cut a TV ad in behalf of it. So it shows what happens when you don't have to face the voters anymore and you can do what you think. So that brings it up. All those states together could bring us up to 36 votes. And then there's a whole bunch of states where what happens in the gubernatorial election really may be determinative. If, if Kansas goes to the Democrat running, uh, I think they will expand next year as well. Uh, Wisconsin, South Dakota, Georgia, Florida are all states where a change in the gubernatorial uh, control could be determinative in some of them. And then North Carolina has a Democratic governor. If Democrats pick up strength in the legislature, they could also come on board. So we might start to see, after a long, dry period, a significant rush. When this all started in 2012 and 13, I made a prediction that by 2020, nearly every state would be part of the expansion. And I was feeling pretty gloomy about it. I'm feeling better about it right now. I wish I could push it back to 2021, because I think the next cycle might actually bring in the remainder of the states. But so it is just fascinating. And every one of those four states is going at it in a particularly different way. Utah and Nebraska are arguing just as much about tax increases to pay for it as the expansion itself. Nebraska and Idaho aren't figuring out how to pay for it. So it's just a fascinating, it's not Congress, it's not the White House, but it is democracy in the states. And these states that have blocked Medicaid expansion for so many years now, and to have the voters come forward and kind of grab policy into their own hands and say, well, if you guys won't do it, we're going to figure it out and we're going to make it happen. It's just, uh, it's just been quite amazing to watch. Uh, so it, there's a subtle difference, and for uh, uh, people it's, it's worth watching. The uh, Medicaid was enacted in 1965. In these four states where the referendums, if you actually watch the ads, they're not running on the ACA. I'm sorry, they're not. They're basically reminding people in Nebraska that we've had Nebraska Medicaid for 40 years. Why not extend it? They are not running on saving the ACA. The reason why the Republican legislators can't vote for it, they're attacked that they're helping the ACA. But all these referendums, I've gotten the ads, I've talked to reporters, they're all running. Why not take the money and expand Medicaid? They're not talking about Obamacare. Mm -hmm. They're just talking about this is money that we can have in Nebraska and Idaho to cover people in a program. We had Nebraska Medicaid for years. So it's being voted on differently than the Florida legislature, which was afraid of being attacked some as a Republican. Of, some of the states that are expressing concern, the Republicans expressing concerns that our cost will increase over time 
are raising what is a frequently not discussed issue, which is that the expansion part of Medicaid receives a much higher federal match, 90%. Initially, it was 100% completely paid for by the federal government. But ultimately, it is legislated at 90%, whereas the rest of the base Medicare program for the poorer population uh, has a federal match that is between 50 and 73%. Now, the notion that 90% is going to persist forever seems unlikely. So some of the state legislators who are saying this is going to cost us more money than it looks like initially are raising what is not an unreasonable position that if you want to really think about what may happen, either what if we're responsible for the same share as the rest of our Medicaid program, or at best, some kind of a blend between the higher rate and our base rate. I think it is only a matter of time and not a very long matter of time until this issue is going to be surfaced in a very frontal way. And then some of the governors or the legislatures that have said, we can't afford this are going to feel like they were accurate prognosticators in ways that they're sorry to see happen. So I don't think this has played out yet. Even in the states that think they have made a decision, the shoe hasn't really fallen as to what their share of the expansion is going to be. I find it hard to believe it's going to remain at 10%. Well, at the same yeah, time, you know, national national commentators tend to focus on the percentage of the match, you know, the 90 percent versus the 10 percent. What state policymakers often focus on is the actual dollars involved, because 10 percent of a very large number is a lot of money. And I, I think a lot of the states that are hesitant about Medicaid expansion, they look around, they don't see a lot of money growing on trees in their state budget. If, if you're wondering why, you, if you live in a state where schools are underfunded and roads are underfunded and emergency services are underfunded, it's typically because Medicaid skyrocketing, skyrocketing costs have limited the fiscal flexibility that states have to fund their other priorities. And taking on an additional responsibility in the Medicaid program makes that harder, especially when you consider, it, depending, it depends on the state, but in a lot of states, the actual amount of net coverage expansion you get from Medicaid is not as high as people think because in states that don't expand Medicaid, the eligibility for the Obamacare exchanges actually expands to people from 100 to 138% of the federal poverty level. And a lot of research, some of it done at Harvard, shows that there are actually a lot of people who have employer-based coverage or have offers of employer-based coverage who drop out of employer-based coverage to take Medicaid when Medicaid is expanded. So the net coverage expansion is not as large, but the fiscal expansion at the state level is significant. And uh, I think that's still going to be an issue even if uh, incrementally states expand. And I think the state to really watch is not so much an Idaho or a Nebraska or a Utah, it's Florida where uh, if uh, uh, Gillum wins that election at the governor's level, I think the likelihood of a Medicaid expansion in Florida goes up. And at the same time, there is growing support for Medicaid expansion in some states that didn't take it initially. There's also a move by some of the same states to propose work requirements in Medicaid, and the federal government has approved some of those. So how do you think that movement factors in here? So I think that uh, every conservative state that expands Medicaid in the current period, and the model is Virginia, the first one to do it, um, they will agree to an expansion only and if it's tied to some kind of work requirement. I think that's a reality, at least for the next few years. Um, interesting, of the 31 states that have expanded Medicaid under the ACA plus the District of Columbia, uh, there's not one that has given serious consideration since the implementation in 2014 of going backwards. Uh, and it's not even an issue. It's not even discussed. Uh, this is an issue in the states that have not expanded. And the pressure internally, not just from consumers seeking insurance, but from the hospital sector who know that expanding Medicaid is actually a vital source of finance that keep rural hospitals and other 
threatened community-based hospitals uh, alive, uh, those pressures just uh, continue to mount and grow. And so that's why I think it's, it's only a matter of time. And, uh, and, and my, my paradigm for this is, is Governor Otter, who was uh, adamantly anti-expansion until he was no longer facing the electorate. And now all of a sudden he sees why it's such a good idea. But I think the work requirement, that question that you had raised, is important to understand why the people in a state want to feel comfortable that those who are receiving Medicaid are being expected to work. I doubt the impact will be particularly great because there's been a lot of pressure in the past for people who can work, who don't either have disabilities, very young children, or some other reason that prevents them from working, that they actually do work. But it's different from having a very clear requirement. It may not change the population's behavior on Medicaid, but it becomes very important to the low-income workers in the state who are saying, I'm working. Why are we giving coverage to people who could work, who might be able to work, and who aren't? So I warn people sometimes, don't get so excited or push back on the work requirements. This may be precisely what allows people in the state to feel comfortable about having a Medicaid expansion as part of their activities. They just want to feel comfortable that anybody who could reasonably be expected to work is out there either looking for a job, in training for a job, or actually working. And you really can't blame low middle income or any worker in a state to say, I'm working, somebody who's getting a program like Medicaid, I want to be sure if there's any way they can work, they're working too. That being said, and you know, rea the reality is whether we like it or not, work requirements are here now mm -hmm. and are going to stick around for a while. And so right now we're in a period where we're having a national experiment about work requirements. And, and the results at this point, I think, you give a lot of cause for concern in Arkansas, for example, where more than 8,000 low-income people have lost coverage because of the work requirements. And one of the deals no, in Arkansas... No, no, because half of them didn't know there were work requirements and didn't do anything. Well, that uh, says there's a problem, but it's a different problem. Well, there's a nature of different problems. But one of it is, yeah, the only, yeah. Way, the only way you prove that you're working is you've got to go on the web, on the internet, and file the results. And a lot of these folks don't have internet connection because they live in rural Arkansas, which is the least connected. So we're getting an experiment in terms of who's really getting hurt. There's a lot of concerns. And so, like it or not, we're going to go through this experiment. But if there's a new Democratic administration in 2021 and the evidence is in that it's more harmful than helpful, I, I, you know, this can, this can get tossed out because this is only an administrative action by CMS. So it can get it's an experiment. It's an important experiment. And so let's learn as much as we can, and then we'll see where it goes from there. It can get to tossed out whether it, quote, works or whether a quote, it doesn't work if there's a change in administration. You and I know that. <laughs> the question of are there people who could be working that aren't working uh, is an important one. Again, I, I think sometimes people of a more liberal persuasion don't appreciate how important it is to low and low middle and middle income workers that they feel comfortable that people who are on the receiving end of benefits are doing everything they can to contribute to their own well-being. If at the end there isn't very much they can do for a variety of reasons, that's one thing. But to not feel comfortable with that people are really out there looking to see what they can do to contribute to their own well-being becomes very important. And I, as I said, for me, sometimes underappreciated uh, by some of the people uh, in the state. So, you know, the irony, the irony of all this is that if you really want to have a robust work requirement, the simplest way to do that is to not expand Medicaid. Because as I mentioned before, eligibility for the exchanges drops down to 100% of the federal poverty level. And if you have a minimum wage job, federal minimum wage, and you work 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, the amount of income you get from that is 120% of the federal poverty level. Which is to say, if you work a minimum wage job full time, you are eligible for very generously subsidized coverage under the Affordable Care Act. 
So uh, the, you compare that to this, this so-called work requirement that, that CMS has proposed, which uh, will also, of course, have face legal challenges and has a lot of exemptions and exceptions that make it uh, a lot less rigorous. Uh, I'm not, if, if that's what you care about as a work requirement, is a work requirement, the Medicaid expansion is not the way to do it. I personally don't support a work requirement because I support universal coverage, and I don't think it should matter whether you have a job or not. But for those who do, Medicaid expansion is really not the way to, to achieve it. Another issue we've seen take center stage in a lot of these campaigns is Medicare, and that's taken on a, a couple different forms. So um, we've got the solvency of Medicare, we've got the idea of Medicare for all. So maybe we can dig a little bit deeper into some of those ideas. Well, you know, when people use the term Medicare for all, they actually never mean Medicare as we now know it expanded for everybody. Maybe that will come out in 2020. I won't hold my breath. I mean, Medicare is in many ways a very gentle program, both especially for the people, the seniors on it. And even while not quite so gentle, pretty gentle on the hospitals and the physicians uh, and the people who provide services. If you look at some of the legislation that was proposed in 2016, uh, I'm thinking about the, some of the Medicare for All legislation uh, under the Sanders campaign, it was much more uh, rigorous in its attempts to control healthcare costs, not surprising because of the big numbers that were going to uh, come out. And as a, a former head of Medicare, I looked at what was being proposed and it was like, whoa, I never could have imagined the kind of power that was being given to the federal government, including shutting down all private insurance as an option to go along with Medicare and enormous control on the pricing, the reimbursement that again, I, I was there when we changed the way physicians were being reimbursed. What we proposed and what was done was such a gentle way to try to modify physician reimbursement relative to what's in the legislation in at least Medicare for All as we saw it a la 2016. So my position has been, you used a term that people feel warm and fuzzy about. Seniors like Medicare with good cause. It treats them very well, big holes in coverage, but for the things it covers, it covers very nicely and not a lot of pushing in direction. The Medicare for All legislation, why it might be uh, fine as a next step for some individuals in the country, is a very aggressive move to give government way more control than we have seen in our program. So watch out, Medicare for All sounds like Medicare as we know it expanded for everybody. Read the fine print or even the medium print. That's not what's being talked about. So it's, it's going to be a compelling conversation in 2019 and 20. Indeed. We'll hear about it a lot. And I wouldn't jump to conclusions about where it will go, either in the Democratic Party and with the nominee or post-2020, because the experience is that while Every, while lots of people can get very excited about how this looks in terms of the benefits that people assume that they will get, when it gets to the financing conversation and how to pay for it, all hell breaks loose. And that is the story of health reform across the United States, national and state, for the last 80 years is when you get down to the conversation about who is going to have to pay how much for this, then all the nice talk disappears and people take out their pitchforks and start going at each other. It was interesting, in 2010 when the ACA was passed, the Democrats were on the defensive because they were offering something and facing a lot of charges about all the harm that will happen to people. And they barely got it through over the finish line. In 2017, Republicans were the change agents, saying, we're going to give you something brilliant and new. And Democrats were saying, look at all the bad things that are going to happen to you. So the Democrats have to worry and be concerned about, are we going to go back to the 2009 and 10 conversation around let's change everything. And if you saw 
Donald Trump's column in USA Today about six weeks ago, which was an attack on Medicare for All. It's really instructive and people ought to save it because it is the script that will be used to try to undermine and cast doubt and create fear among people, particularly senior citizens around it. The other issue that ha gets raised and I think will become raised if it's uh, a serious proposal is many workers and their families like employer-sponsored insurance. This issue came up in some of the discussions uh, pre the Affordable Care Act. And if the concept is you're going to take away an employer-sponsored insurance that you're comfortable with, that you've had for a while, that's familiar to you and your family, as much as people complain about various aspects of their insurance, as we've seen in the past, when someone threatens to take away something they have, they all of a sudden seem to embrace it tightly because they know what they have now. And the question is, do they want to give it, that up with something as yet to be defined, promised in the future? In employer-sponsored insurance, American public seems surprisingly attached to it, given how many complaints we frequently hear aside from when it's being attacked. So it's, you know, it's a core principle of behavioral economics that people value hypothetical losses more yes. than they value hypothetical gains. And that's, I think, what we see playing out again and again and again. At the same time, at the same time, there, I think, needs to be a recognition that for a large number of the um, large part of the American public, our health care system really stinks in terms of how people get treated, particularly when you get sick and you're facing high costs. And there's a resentment and anger by people who see that and experience that, which is why our colleague Ashish Jha did a paper in JAMA in March, and they looked at 11 countries in terms of quality, access, price, and cost. And one of the many areas where the U.S. came in dead last was on public satisfaction with the U.S. healthcare system. There were some serious systemic problems that really raise issues that I think get absolutely at what you're talking about with the resentments around work requirements, but rather than try to take coverage away from people and decide, who deserves it or not, we ought to be about trying to create a better, fairer system for everybody. And single payer and Medicare for all is one route, and there's other routes as well. So we just want to make sure we have time to yeah. get to some questions. Um, so what do you think the implications, this, these came in advance, um, what are the implications for women's health if the government becomes particularly unfavorable towards Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood? It depends what the government becoming unfavorable is translated to mean. Uh, if it is outlawing abortions, which I comfortably feel I can predict is simply not going to happen. Uh, speaking of things that aren't likely to be taken away, that would be one of them. That obviously could have a lot of repercussion. In general, what we've seen is the expansion under the Affordable Care Act has made health care for all people, but particularly for women who had, did not have access, access to it uh, in important ways. There are no indications that is getting retracted. So I do not see that as a serious threat. Now, others, of course, may look at it differently. I just don't think that kind of retraction is consistent with any of the signals that we have seen sent uh, about how hard it is and how much people will push back if you try to take something that has been around any significant amount of time, uh, which I had predicted that if we got through 2012 and the ACA wasn't changed, which meant we in 2014 people would get the expansion of benefits, it was never going away. Modified, yes. Going away, not a chance. No, nothing in our history suggests that happens. One thing we have to remember is that if Roe v. Wade were to be overturned by a future Supreme Court, all that would do is mean that states would then have sovereignty over abortion policy in their jurisdictions, which is how things worked before Roe v. Wade initially came about in, I think, 1972. 
So in, obviously in every blue state, abortion would remain legal. I think in every purple state, abortion would remain legal. And even in the red states, uh, I think there would be a lot of pressure to, to maintain the legality of abortion in most cases. And frankly, um, I, it doesn't seem to me that why it would be so terrible if, uh, if we actually had a democratic process in which we deliberated on whether abortion should be legal or not, given how controversial of an issue it is. It seems to me we should hold legislators and democracy accountable for abortion policy rather than nine unelected judges. Uh, I have to disagree mildly. Uh, so in the slide that I showed you about uh, there's a significant group of people who are not in favor uh, of abortion, it turns out they live together in the same state. Uh, and you have this completely wrong. There will be a dozen states, if they're given leeway, who are not going to end the Quibla River Sweep. They're going to make restrictions very substantially. What's going to change is, is if the administration allows those states to do that and if the Supreme Court does. But I can, in, in, in fairness, th there have been referendums which in the South have dramatically limited access to abortion. I'm sorry, they just have. And Limited is not the same thing as making illegal. Uh, uh, That's so, an important distinction. It's an essential distinction, in fact. It is not in terms, uh, when you have states where there are three centers left, Please don't tell me uh, that when you, there is no place to go uh, where they have to fly in a doctor from another state, uh, that technically it's legal. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the geography is really where people deeply feel that it should be limited and in other states it shouldn't. So the battle will, will go on and the Supreme Court may be at the end calling whether or not a Mississippi law, an Arkansas law, still falls within their decision about Roe versus Wade. But if you're in the polling, you actually know people live near each other who want abortion restricted. And then there are people who in, want- In democracy, that's okay, uh, that's, generally. I, I'm not arguing democracy. I just, I'm arguing, please don't tell me there will be no change regardless of the election. I'm sorry, it just, oh, I, you no, can't- No, that's, not what, you, that's yeah. not what I said. Yeah. That's not what I said. What I said was that states will retain sovereignty over abortion policy and that that's a good thing for democracy. I'm that not, people uh, should actually be able to decide in their states what abortion policy is. I'm not, I'm be not arguing that, court. but it, it could change with the election. That's all I need, need to do is it's just not fair to people living in states where the restrictions are quite enormous to say to them it doesn't matter what happens in, in an election or it doesn't matter who's on the Supreme Court. I never said, I never said I, it didn't I'm not matter. I'm doing that. I'm just clarifying an issue that's being discussed. Uh, I never refer to people whatever they say. But be that as it is, there are a group of voters who would limit this and a group of voters who absolutely wouldn't. That's why elections will continue to matter here. We have, they should. We have a question from Gina Wilson, who is a current board member from the Mental Health Association in Delaware. This was part of a longer question involving the lack of mental health providers, including psychiatrists, that participate in non-government health plans. So her question is, what is being done to improve treatment access for mental health services particularly for those with commercial health plans which have limited benefits or poor coverage for mental health services? So, mm -hmm. Go ahead. there's a lot that has happened over the past 10 years that has made major improvements in terms of mental health access and services and coverage. Uh, the Affordable Care Act for the first time includes behavioral health as one of the 10 essential health benefits so that every commercial policy sold in the United States must include coverage for those services. The 2008 parity law required parity between different kinds of commercial coverage with public coverage. So there's been a lot of progress. The 21st Century Cures Act that passed a few years ago also had some important advances. And there's a lot more that needs to be done. There's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of particularly health disparities between whites and non-whites in terms of access to services. Uh, so I think it's important. The story is that there's been a lot of progress made and there's still an enormous amount of work yet to be done. But the concern that was raised in the question which you really didn't uh, address, is not the expansion of coverage, but the challenge of finding people who to ride services in response to this expansion in coverage. Uh, and that is a challenge. Uh, there are some things that are being done at the state level uh, to try to empower individuals who are trained, but not 
only a very limited number of mental health professionals to be able to take on some of these functions. There are attempts, particularly in the military, to um, empower with training and support some of the primary care physicians to be able to deal with some of the mental health issues, not just because that expands the supply, but for at least some individuals, you don't feel as stigmatized seeking mental health support from your primary caregiver, physician, nurse, nurse practitioner, whoever, as you may to actually seek out a mental health provider. Uh, for a lot of uh, prime working age males in particular, uh, this stigma issue uh, has remained very serious. So I think you see an attempt to try to be responsive. There's a challenge when you are in short supply to be able to respond to an increase in demand. I mean, we see this occasionally in Medicare where people on Medicare get access to services as long as there are services to be had in the area where they're living. Where there's a general geographic shortage, they have trouble accessing services in the same way everybody else does. And you see some of this in terms of the mental uh, health issue, which is there's been a lot of expansion on the demand side for a whole variety of reasons, not as much on the supply side, although some. And, and the question is, can we be smart and creative about how we respond to this additional demand rather than stovepiping more than necessary who might be able to help in terms of supplying uh, the services individuals need. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we would like to encourage you to tune into the next forum, The Health and Economic Concerns of Rural Americans. That'll be on November 9th from noon to 1 p.m. And you can also go to forumhsph.org. Thank you very much. Thank you.